Hello everyone, sorry for jumping in before the episode, but I just want to tell you all about the Thinking in English Patreon. Patreon is a way for you guys to support Thinking in English and receive some amazing benefits. We have conversation clubs at least six times a week, allowing you to practice your English speaking. We offer weekly discussion sessions with English tutors, including me, where you can ask any questions you have. We have a Discord server and chat rooms, so you can talk and meet other English learners and practice English. I release bonus episodes every Friday, and depending on your subscription level, there are also free English group classes and one-on-one -on -one conversations with me available. There are also some new and exciting new benefits coming in the next few weeks, so join now! I'm currently offering 7 day free trials if you join right now. Click the link in the description or go to www.patreon.com forward slash thinking in English to join now. Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast for intermediate to advanced level English learners. The Orkney Islands a group of British islands north of Scotland are considering the possibility of leaving the UK, shocking the entire country. Let's take a deeper look into Orkney's unique history and some possibilities for its future. As always, there is a free transcript for today's episode over on the Thinking in English blog. The link is in the description. Here is today's vocabulary list. Archipelago Archipelago A group of small islands. For example, the Hawaiian archipelago is made up of large and tiny islands. Heritage Heritage The cultural historical or natural traditions passed down through generations. As in, it has been difficult for the region to preserve its cultural heritage. Dowry Dowry In some societies, an amount of money or property that a woman's parents give to the man that she marries. For example, the princess's dowry was paid in diamonds. To ignore. To ignore. To intentionally not listen or give attention to. For example, how can the government ignore the wishes of the majority? Let down. Let down. To feel disappointed or betrayed by someone or something. For instance, she doesn't want to let her parents down. Autonomous Autonomous An autonomous organisation, country or region is independent and has the freedom to govern itself. For example, the autonomous region can make its own tax rules. Self-governing Self-governing a country or an area that is self-governing is controlled by the people living there. As in, Puerto Rico is a self-governing territory of the United States. Tax havens Tax havens Countries or territories with favourable tax regulations. For example, the Channel Islands are well-known tax havens. Headlines were made in British newspapers last month when the Orkney Islands announced they were going to explore the possibility of leaving the United Kingdom and maybe even joining Norway. While this is unlikely and just one of many options they are considering, it is a really interesting topic. Today, I want to talk about Orkney, discuss the island's Viking history and investigate the different possibilities for the future of the islands. So, let's start with the history of the Orkney Islands. The Orkney Islands, often simply called Orkney, are a group of islands located off the north-eastern coast of Scotland. 
they are between the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean, approximately 16 kilometres or 10 miles north of the Scottish mainland. The Orkney archipelago comprises around 70 islands, of which 20 are inhabited or have people living on them. The history of the Orkney Islands dates back thousands of years. Archaeological evidence suggests that the islands were first inhabited thousands of years ago, with evidence of hunter-gatherer communities. One of the most notable sites in Orkney is Skara Bray, a remarkably well-preserved village that dates back over 5,000 years. Skara Bray demonstrates that the early people of Orkney had both advanced building techniques and a level of social organisation sophisticated for its time. The early residents of Orkney also built a series of impressive stone circles and burial tombs, such as the Ring of Brogar and the Mayshaw Chambered Tomb. In the late 8th century and early 9th centuries, the Orkney Islands came to the attention of Norse invaders. Vikings and their chieftains and their followers settled in the islands and eventually established the Earldom of Orkney, which had its capital in Kirkwall on the mainland. And they liked the islands so much that the Vikings stayed for around 500 years. The Orkneys were used as a base for Norse expeditions to other regions, and also as a place for farming. In the 12th century, an Icelandic author wrote the Orkneyinga, a saga that accounted for the history of Viking Orkney. The Vikings had a significant impact on the island's culture, language and governance. They introduced the Old Norse language, which over time blended with existing Pictish and Celtic languages spoken by the native population. Norse influence also extended to local customs, laws and names of places that still today are present in Orkney. In fact, around 30% of the population of the Orkney Islands have Scandinavian ancestry. Not surprising, considering that the islands were Norse and owned by Norway for far longer than they have been part of the United Kingdom. So, how did Orkney end up as part of the UK, or, or I guess first, part of Scotland? Well, in the 15th century, the islands were still under the control of Norway, and Denmark, I guess, along with the Shetland Islands, Faroe Islands, and other islands in the region. In 1468, King Christian I of Norway, who was also the King of Denmark, faced some financial difficulties and debt issues. He entered into negotiations with King James III of Scotland and arranged for a marriage between his daughter, Princess Margaret of Denmark, and King James III himself. As part of this marriage agreement, Orkney and Shetland were given to Scotland as security for Princess Margaret's dowry. So that dowry is the amount of money to be given by one family to the other during marriage. And as this was a royal wedding, the dowry was a substantial amount of money paid to the Scottish crown. However, the dowry was never fully paid leading to a dispute between Norway and Scotland over the islands, because Orkney and Shetland were given as security for the dowry. So if that, if that money was not paid, the islands would then become Scottish. In 1472, the financial dispute was finally settled, and Orkney and Shetland were formally annexed to Scotland, becoming part of the Scottish realm. From that point on, the islands ceased to be under Norwegian control and became integrated into the Kingdom of Scotland. When Scotland joined with England to form the United Kingdom, the Orkney Islands joined as well. Since the 15th century, the Orkney Islands have remained part of Scotland, though their isolation from the mainland meant they retained their distinct cultural identity. 
agriculture and fishing were vital to the island's economy, and during the two world wars, Orkney's location was of great importance. The British Royal Navy established a presence in the island's natural harbours, and it was a base for the British fleet during both of the wars. As the 20th century progressed, Orkney experienced changes in its economy. There has been a decline in traditional industries like fishing and agriculture, and a rise in tourism. The island's rich historical heritage, stunning landscapes and wildlife attract visitors from around the world. And renewable energy, particularly wind and marine energy, has become a major industry in Orkney, with projects aiming to make the island's energy self-sufficient and even export energy to the Scottish mainland. So, you have probably heard that Scotland one of the four nations of the United Kingdom, held a referendum a few years ago on whether or not Scotland should leave the UK. Despite choosing to stay united with England in that vote, there are still politicians in the country pushing for Scottish independence. Orkney is also not happy with the United Kingdom. In fact, Orkney is not happy with Scotland either. They are considering the possibility of leaving both the United Kingdom and Scotland. At least, this is what was reported in newspapers across the UK and in other parts of the world last month. It is obviously big news when any region considers the possibility of leaving a country, and this can result in violence, protests and massive controversy. The truth is somewhat different to the attention-grabbing headlines. According to the Orkney Islands Council, they want to explore alternative forms of governance which could include changing its legal status within the UK. So why would Orkney want to change its status? Well, it's not happy with the levels of support and resources it receives from the two different governments that support the islands. That's right, due to the UK's political system, the Orkney Islands are actually under the control of two different governments, the UK government in London and the devolved Scottish government in Edinburgh. Many people don't realise that Scotland, Northern Ireland and, to a little lesser extent, Wales, have their own governments with their own laws and powers. This is why university in Scotland is cheaper for Scottish students than English students. And also the Scottish school system is completely different and has different exams compared to England. However, Orkney is dissatisfied with both governments. They believe that both London and especially Edinburgh have not been supportive of developing the islands. Many people in Orkney feel left out and ignored, especially compared to other Scottish islands, like the Shetland Islands and the Western Isles. The recent anger is partly due to an argument about ferries and transport between the islands and the Scottish mainland, with Orkney once again feeling let down by the rest of Scotland. By changing the relationship with the UK, perhaps even leaving the UK, Orkney believes they would be able to find more economic opportunities. For this reason, the Orkney Council is going to explore a number of different proposals for the future of the islands. So the much-reported proposal is that Orkney could leave the UK and seek to rejoin Norway, the country it once belonged to. But this is not the only option. They are also going to explore the possibility of becoming a crown dependency, or even an overseas territory. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. Let's start with rejoining Norway. As I mentioned earlier, the Orkney Islands were under Norwegian control for several centuries, from the late 8th century to the late 15th century, before becoming part of Scotland in 1472. This potential arrangement would involve Orkney seeking to reunite with Norway after leaving Scotland and the United Kingdom. 
Why would they want to do this? Well, there's history and culture. Rejoining Norway may provide Orkney with more opportunities and resources to preserve and promote its unique Norse heritage, languages and traditions. There are economic reasons. Norway is known for having a strong economy, especially in industries like oil, gas, renewable energies and fisheries, which are the main industries in the Orkney Islands as well. Rejoining could potentially lead to more cooperation and benefits for the Orkney Islands. Orkney could benefit from autonomy and representation. While part of Norway, Orkney may be granted a level of freedom or autonomy and its interests could be represented at a national level. And also Norway and Orkney share maritime boundaries in the North Sea and being part of Norway could provide Orkney with more influence over its waters. The next possibility is a crown dependency. A crown dependency is a type of political and constitutional relationship between certain territories and the United Kingdom. While crown dependencies are under the sovereignty of the British crown, they are not part of the UK itself and have their own separate legal, political and administrative systems. The three current crown dependencies are Jersey, which is located in the English Channel near the coast of France, Guernsey, also in the English Channel, and the Isle of Man, which is located in the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Ireland. The key features of crown dependencies are self-governance, those dependencies have their own governments and legal systems, allowing them freedom to make their own choices. They also have the crown, right? They have the same king as the UK. They don't have any representation in the UK Parliament. Crown dependencies do not elect members of Parliament and they are not represented in either the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And finally, they have financial independence. They have the power over their own taxes and manage their finances independently. They also maintain their own legal systems, including their own courts of law. So by joining or becoming a crown dependency, Orkney could benefit from increased freedom. Just like being an autonomous region, they would be able to make decisions that better suit their own needs and priorities. Crown dependencies can raise their own taxes and manage their own finances. The current three are famous tax havens and home to many large companies. This could benefit Orkney. Crown dependencies have their own identities, unique traditions. So while benefiting from the protection and the security of Britain, crown dependencies are more unique and distinct and free. As a crown dependency, Orkney may gain recognition on the international stage, leading to more opportunities and partnerships. And as a crown dependency, it could have more freedom to preserve and promote its cultural and historical assets. The next option could be an overseas territory. An overseas territory of the United Kingdom is a political relationship between certain territories and the UK. Overseas territories are self-governing and not part of the UK itself. The status of an overseas territory is distinct from that of a crown dependency. It's a little complicated, but crown dependencies are self-governing territories with the king as their head of state. So they're basically completely independent, apart from the UK being responsible for their defence. Overseas territories, however, usually have a governor or a leader chosen by the UK government. Despite this, many of the features of being a crown dependency and overseas territory are the same. Some level of self-governance, no representation in parliament, financial freedom, etc. So by becoming an overseas territory, Orkney could gain more control over its affairs compared to right now when it's part of Scotland and the UK. It has two different governments making decisions for it. There are financial benefits, tax and choosing what to spend money on itself. There's the possibility of more international representation. 
Overseas territories have a recognised status on the international stage, and this could provide Orkney with greater opportunities for partnerships, trade agreements and cooperation. And becoming an overseas territory could potentially offer more control and opportunities to Orkney in managing its waters and resources. And then the final opportunity or possibility I want to talk about today is becoming a self-governing territory. So an example of a self-governing territory is the Faroe Islands, which are part of the Kingdom of Denmark. The Faroe Islands have their own parliament, government and legal system, and they manage many of their internal affairs independently from Denmark. However, Denmark retains control over areas like defence and foreign affairs. In fact, many people think the Faroe Islands are an independent country. They have their own football team, uh, they compete in uh, different international competitions, um, and they have their own laws and policies. But they are part of Denmark. They are a self-governing territory. So if Orkney was to become a self-governing territory of the UK or of Scotland or even of Norway, they would have greater autonomy. Like the Faroe Islands, they would be able to make their own laws and policies. They would be able to manage their own resources, such as fishing and renewable energy. The Faroe Islands famously have a very uh, aggressive fishing policy, especially when it comes to whales and dolphins. Um, and Denmark can't stop it. So Orkney would also be able to make its own decisions and its own policies about fishing and managing oil and gas. There would be opportunities for economic development. Orkney could be able to attract investments, support businesses and focus on growth in its own way. As a self-governing status, Orkney could have more distinct and recognised international representation, leading to more opportunities. And finally, as a self-governing territory, Orkney could collaborate with the UK. While enjoying a higher level of freedom, Orkney would still be part of the UK, allowing for continued collaboration on matters of national importance, such as defence and foreign affairs. So here is today's final thought. What is the future of the Orkney Islands? Well, to be completely honest, I think their future will be as part of Scotland, with not much changing. While it's interesting to consider the possibility of leaving the UK or renegotiating the relationship with the UK, it is quite unlikely. However, this situation may highlight to the governments in Edinburgh and London that they need to remember and consider the Orkney Islands and other small communities around the country. These regions with only a few thousand people are not powerful in terms of population or political power and are often ignored or forgotten by those at the centre of power. Orkney is fed up with this situation and is aiming to demonstrate this by exploring possibilities for its future. But what do you think? Does your country have any regions or areas that could or want to consider leaving in the future? Let me know by leaving a comment on Spotify, a comment on the Thinking in English blog on the transcript, or reach out and send me a message on Instagram. If you enjoyed this episode and you enjoy listening to Thinking in English, please consider supporting me and supporting the podcast. You can do this by sharing with your friends, recommending people to listen, sharing on social media, or even financially supporting me over on Patreon. Just a few dollars a month goes a long way into helping me turn Thinking in English into a successful company and launching more podcasts and more great things for you guys. So thank you and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.